an editorial saying all clinicians should be doing this. And I thought, well, doing what? So this, um, this sort of thinking has led us to ask about the problem of getting the descriptions from trials or systematic reviews in practice. And so um, Carl Hennigan and I did a study a couple of years ago where we looked at the adequacy of the descriptions that were in the EBM journal things. This is, so these were studies that we thought were valid and that we thought were important that should change practice. And we looked at 80 of them, which was a year worth um, of things from the EBM journal. And the question we asked is, could we replicate this tomorrow if we saw a patient with it? And the overall answer is just, just under 50% of them were replicable. Um, trials were better than systematic reviews. Drugs were better than non-drug therapies, as you might expect. So the bad news is a lot of things are not replicable. The good news is that we tried to fix it. We wrote to authors, tracked down references, did all sorts of things to try and get the additional information that made it replicable and we could fix about half of this. Which is fantastic because it was about a day's work to do this. I think it's the most cost effective thing I could think of to do in medicine that we could potentially do. If you think of the costs of a trial and you spend one extra day to get the information that would fix one in four of those, that is just incredibly cost effective. Much more cost effective than the original trial. As a follow-up to this, um, Ian, and, Ian Chalmers and I wrote a paper recently about the avoidable waste in the production of research. And I've just been talking about um, the last part here, a usable report. There are all sorts of problems um, in the, the reports that we actually have available. One of them is the description of the interventions, but others are poor reporting of what was actually the primary outcome. People s swap around things when it actually comes to publication, so there are bits missing that... Um, don't allow you to appraise the paper, etc. So that's poor. But we decided there are actually f um, four stages that we could break research production down into. Um, are the questions relevant to patients and clinicians? By asking the right questions in the first place. Did they use appropriate design methods? Did they um, ever publish it? And was the report usable? The three of these stages we could actually quantify. There are various things that says um, less than 50% of the articles actually have an appropriate method and design. There are flaws um, in the way that the trials are set up and there are flaws in not looking at previous studies. Most of them didn't access a systematic review even when it was already available at the time they were writing the protocol, which is just amazing. The other appalling thing is that less than 50% of studies never get published in full of abstracts, for example, um, um, presented at uh, um, oncology trial meetings, conferences, less than 50% of them, no, sorry, about 50% of them have been published after um, a period of eight years. And there's been a systematic review of um, Sally Hopewell's that suggested that that's probably about right for the overall 50%. So if you multiply those things together, you can get roughly something like about an 85% loss that occurs in the usability of publications, not counting this first one, addressing the right questions in the first place. The world expenditure on um, research at the moment is about, it's over 100 billion US dollars per year. So you could say an est a rough estimate of the waste is about 85 billion dollars per year. This is just an amazing <laughs> thing that we're allowing to happen at the moment. When some of it is very difficult to fix, but other elements of this are actually incredibly easy to fix and a small investment could save billions of dollars worth of wasted research um, that we're not using at the moment. Okay, I want to end on a brighter note than that. So I'm going to talk, so the last couple of slides will be about team-based EBM, um, digesting the evidence. Um, when I first started doing evidence-based medicine, I thought of it as a sort of solo thing that you did basically as a form of continuing medical education. But more and more I'm becoming convinced that you actually have to do this as a team because often the whole team in a practice has to make the appropriate changes. It's not individual practice, but the, the coordination between different members is important. And getting the appropriate training and infrastructure set up in order to do things. Um, so we run, in my practice, a fortnightly journal club and I spoke to you, uh, several of you last night about this next actions thing. Not only is, do we read the evidence, but we need to agree on what the basic conclusions, the clinical bottom line is, but also to organise what the, the next actions would be. And I would like to see that. I know it happens, in, in, happens very little in primary care. Um, there are several practices in um, Oxfordshire now that this is happening in though, which is great. 
The other thing that I'd like to see happening is collaboration between these practices then. Because often there's a lot of effort that goes into working out how to implement something in the individual practice. For example, there are things that have taken me months to get implemented in my practice to sort out the bugs. And it would be nice that once you've done that, you could share that with another practice. So we're trying to establish collaborations both here within Oxford, but we've got some funding to do this within Milton Keynes, where we're getting the practices not only to run the journal clubs, but also to share ideas across the practice and also work with the primary care trust in order to implement those in practice. So where there's something where the, the trust would need to put in more resources to have something happening, um, they'll actually help out in doing that. So these are called impact groups. Yeah. That was the best acronym we could come up with so far. If anyone ever comes up with a really sexy acronym for, or name for journal clubs, I'd love to know. Um, and I just wanted to give some examples of some of the projects that they're doing. Carpal tunnel syndrome, where you inject patients before you refer them, um, which is, happens in a few places, but now there's specific um, trained people to be able to do that and it's decreasing the number of people that need referral for carpal tunnel syndrome. One group to, um, implemented delayed antibiotic prescriptions and could record it through setting up an EMIS code. Smoking cessation has probably been the most successful. That's been a coordination between both the practices, the pharmacists and the PCT, um, leading to huge reductions in the number of people um, taking up at least nicotine replacement therapy for smoking cessation. And then there's a whole series of others that have happened as well. Okay, so just as a summary slide, I think the, the glass for EBM, for where we are at present and where we need to go in the future is half empty and half full. There's been this amazing growth in research and trial since that first trial in 1948. Um, so we're now up to probably close to a million trials now, one and a half thousand per year. Um, but much of it is poor, unsynthesized or unusable, as we saw. Search engines are improving all the time. So can you imagine trying to do EBM in the days when you used to have the paper index medicuses? It would just be impossible. And we've moved on a lot by having it electronic, but now we're getting improved filters and improved systematic reviews and ways of trying to organise that information. But it's still very disorganised. And little effort goes into that compared with the, the effort to do the primary research in the first place to make it usable. So, half, half empty and half full. And finally, the skills in EBM, I think they're increasing. So if I'd done that survey that I talked about 20 years ago, they would have said, what's evidence-based medicine? Quite rightly, because the term hadn't been invented. But if I'd said, what was clinical epidemiology? It probably wasn't being done. It's now happening in many medical schools. And I see, interestingly, when I go around the world, there's a huge interest in this. And it's happening in a lot of places around the world, in the Middle East and Asia, um, as, as well as the sort of developed places of, the, of Canada, the US, etc. But it's still very patchy and it's still ignored in many medical schools. So I think the future is bright, but for those interested in doing work in EBM, there's a lot more still to do. Thank you very much.